So I've always been a pretty big fan of the Pokemon franchise. And as you may know, I'm also something of a paleo nerd. So some of my favorites of these little pocket monsters have always been some of the ones that are based on different forms of prehistoric life. But I remember all the way back in 1996 when I first got my very first copy of Pokemon Blue. And it was time for me to make the biggest decision of my young life. Bulbasaur, Squirtle, or Charmander? I picked Bulbasaur. Objectively, the best choice. Fight me. And I could sit here and tell you all the reasons why this is the case based on type matchups and all that stuff, but I feel like that's not why you're here. So I want to tell you now why, as a paleo nerd, Bulbasaur is still the best starter Pokemon. For you see, despite this little thing that looks like a cross between a frog and a cabbage not being based on any form of prehistoric life at the time that it was first designed, 21 years later, it would turn out to have been the inspiration behind the naming of an actual animal that existed 255 million years ago. That name being Bulbasaurus. But before we get into this amazing little guy, here's Tim Tim with a disclaimer message. The animal being talked about today is going to be discussed based on the geological evidence we have available at the time of this recording. We hope that in the future more fossils are found that expand our understanding of the history of the natural world. However, please understand that if new fossil evidence is found, it is very possible that the information provided in this video will be considered outdated or wrong. This is just something that we have to accept when talking about animals that nobody has seen alive, and if our information is proven incorrect, we know that all of those watching our videos will understand and not come out of the woodwork and bombard the comments of a five-year-old video to tell us that we're stupid for not knowing something that nobody knew at the time of recording this, because that would make you an asshat. Don't be an asshat. In recent years, there's been a lot of interesting choices in the naming of newly discovered species in the fossil record. After all, we now live in a world where there's an abelosaurid that is literally named Thanos. And technically, yes, the official statement is that the name Bulbasaurus is based on the nasal bosses on the skull that are a well-known feature on many different Dicynodonts, which is the clade that Bulbasaurus belongs to. And the name simply translates to Bulbous Reptile. This clade of synapsids, or stem mammals, are known for having a pair of tusk-like teeth and a beak for feeding on vegetation. And that's where the type species for Bulbasaurus gets its name. Bulbasaurus phylloxeron, which means leaf razor. And come on. In the official publication, it states that the name Bulbasaurus does not directly refer to the Pokémon. However, the scientists who originally discovered this creature have actually been asked about the seemingly all-too-convenient naming. And their response was, Similarities between this species and a certain other squat tusk quadruped may not be entirely coincidental. If one wishes to read between the lines concerning certain similarities, I wouldn't stop them. So, make of that what you will. The topic of synapsids is something that I'm very surprised I haven't gotten into in greater detail before. It's definitely on my list of different animal groups that I want to talk about. But for the purposes of this video, we've talked about how dinosaurs kind of blur the line between reptiles and birds. Well, synapsids are the exact same thing between reptiles and the mammals. And even though we don't actually know for sure what species of synapsids were actually furry, the fact is that we keep finding more and more evidence that different groups of dinosaurs were covered in feathers. This has led many to believe that synapsids may have first developed hair millions of years before some of them became true mammals. And unfortunately, because Permian fossils are generally not nearly as well preserved as many different Mesozoic fossils, we have yet to find a bounty of remains showing fur imprints in the same way that we have found feather imprints on dinosaurs. So, was Bulbasaurus actually furry? We really can't say for sure. Hell, this entire species has only really been identified by a handful of skulls. And the only reason why we can guess what this animal might have looked like at all is because we have more remains from other similarly sized Dicynodonts like Dyinkodon. The Permian is one of the most interesting times in Earth's history to me. But a lot of people share the opinion that the animals that ruled the Earth before the dinosaurs were extremely primitive. This really couldn't be further from the truth, though. 
and in a way it actually directly mirrors our opinions that we used to have of dinosaurs. Throughout the 19th and 20th century, scientists and paleoartists both depicted dinosaurs more like this than what we're used to seeing today. The thing that changed was our increase in understanding that came from more telling fossils that the dinosaurs were active, advanced animals that really were no more or less primitive than mammals or birds. Unfortunately, the farther back in time you go, the less complete our fossil record is. So it's for this reason that we only have a fraction of as many fossil sites that date back to the Permian than we do, say, the, for the Cretaceous. The handful of good fossil sites that date to this time are our only window to a world that's so far removed from ours that you could be excused for thinking that it was an alien world. This is why the Karoo Supergroup in South Africa is so incredibly valuable to our understanding of natural history. A supergroup is basically an area that shows geological evidence from two or more eras in Earth's history, and the Karoo is hands down one of the best, yielding fossils from the Carboniferous, Permian, Triassic, and Jurassic. This is an astounding 214 million years of this region's history preserved. And the Permian layer here is one of the richest in the world. And it's one of our very few windows into what life might have been like at this time. A time that I cannot wait to get into in a future History of the Earth video. And you can guarantee that I'll be referencing the crew more whenever I do finally cover the Permian. Despite us having such limited fossil evidence for Bulbasaurus, what we do have of it and its relatives can give us clues about what these animals were like in life. Looking at the skull in comparison to other Dicynodonts, we estimate that Bulbasaurus was around 60 centimeters or two-ish feet long. Like others of its kind, it had a beak and only two teeth in its mouth. Although in Bulbasaurus, the beak is much more hooked and its tusks were larger than in other small-bodied Dicynodonts. That's the official reason why it was given the suggestive species name of Leaf Razor. The Dicynodonts were the most successful group of herbivorous animals from the late Permian. And in fact, they were probably one of the most successful groups of animals in all of Earth's history evolving into many different species of all different shapes and sizes. The specific family of Dicynodonts that Bulbasaurus belonged to is called Gaikidae, and these were the ones that were known for having those nasal bosses on their face. Not unlike what we see in other animals that had nasal bosses, these were probably more likely used for display than anything like fighting. If it was to get into a fight, Bulbasaurus would probably use its razor leaf, or I'm sorry, leaf razor for that. Now unfortunately, as far as we can tell, Bulbasaurus is probably one of the many casualties that did not survive the Permian mass extinction. However, several species of Dicynodonts did survive and joined the host of bizarre animals during the Triassic, with species like Lystrosaurus becoming one of the most abundant animals from that time as well. The Dicynodonts as a whole are a group that I'm very excited to bring more attention to. This species has gained a decent amount of notoriety because of its name, but as a whole, these animals and so many others from this time are largely unknown to the general public. This is in a large part because of lacking information that we have because of the limited remains. And it's animals like this that are the reason why I decided to make the Paleo Catalogs Basics series. Even though I know you guys love when I talk about animals from the Paleozoic era, the fact is that the majority of them lack the fossil evidence to be able to do a full catalog video. I want to thank everyone for making it to this point in the video. If you are enjoying this type of content, don't forget to leave a like. And leave a comment below to tell me of any other animals you'd like to see me give a Paleo Catalogs Basics treatment to. Have a good one, everybody.